have it all morning, so let's oh. hover over to the driving range. Usually science fiction goes terribly wrong. Probably we want to avoid those dystopian futures. But if you think of Big Hero 6, I think, you know, nice squishy robots that help us, that monitor our health. I think, think WALL-E is another good example, although WALL-E also makes us a very low, lazy society. But I think ultimately, at science fiction movies where humans and robots do get along in the end, although there's a little bit of a journey going in that direction. But science fiction is not always the best source of information for how we, how we should design. I didn't know we had a pool. Welcome to Euronews Tech Talks, the podcast that delves into the pressing questions shaping Europe's digital landscape. I'm your host, Takumbo Salako. Previously, we explored the intricacies of generative AI, including the groundbreaking ChatGPT, which has rapidly gained global attention. This software has already revolutionized the lives and routines of Europeans. In this episode, I'm joined in conversation by two experts in AI who'll share their views about where this technology might be going. Amidst the excitement around ChatGPT, numerous questions are coming up about the dangers it might pose. Are we on the brink of a Terminator-like scenario where AI creates a nuclear winter, machines reign and humans face an existential threat? Or are we on a path to something more like the animated film Wally, where robots take over tasks and chores, enabling humans to live leisurely but also lazy lives? The future is hard to predict, but even some of the people responsible for ChatGPT's development, like OpenAI CEO Sam Altman, have expressed reservations about the technology's future. My worst fears are that we cause significant harm to the world. I think that could happen in a lot of different ways. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. We're almost ready. We need okay. just three more minutes. This is tough. We, we've got a problem here in the internal. So apologies for this. There's never a robot around when, when you need one, is there? Now, I won't bother you with the technical problems we had while recording the conversation for this episode, but let's just say I wish I had some AI to help troubleshoot that day. Here's my conversation with Dr. Sabine Howard and Dr. Matthew Glanville, who will tell you more about themselves and their work with AI here in a second. So first of all, just for the record, can I get you both to introduce yourselves, please? Uh, let's start off with you, Dr. Sabine. I'm Sabine Howard. I'm an associate professor of swarm engineering at the University of Bristol, and I'm also the executive trustee of AIHub.org. Okay, and what is exactly swarm engineering? Swarm engineering looks at how you could make many robots work together. And the idea being is very many tasks in the real world require you to have lots of robots that work together. If you look at birds and ants and bees and actually human societies, we work together quite well. And so we take inspiration from these technologies to make robots that can do the same. Okay, and Dr. Matthew Glanville? Yep, I'm Matt Glanville. I'm the Director of Assessment at the International Baccalaureate. So that means that I'm responsible for making sure that all of the IB's exams run smoothly and also mean the same thing around the world and are useful to students in moving on to the next steps in education. Okay, well, you're both at the heart of you know, what we're talking about here, artificial intelligence, and so much has been said about it. You, know, you can't escape the, the conversations, whether you're in the homes, offices, or schools nowadays. Um, is it something that should be feared or favoured? Let's start off with you, Dr. Sabine. I'm excited about the technology. Uh, if, if you look at the time that we've spent working on the technology, it's finally ripe to get out into the real world. And I think what we need to get right now is how we communicate about the technology, how we have these conversations about where the technology can be useful and where, where there's real challenges with the technology. Do you share those sentiments? I think the most important thing is to recognise it is here. It is part of the world in which we now live, and it will be part of the world that our students live in as well going forward. So more than anything else, we need to be helping our students learn its strengths, its weaknesses, how to use it ethically, how to make it part of their everyday life in a way that benefits them rather than being a challenge or disempowers them. Okay. Have you both been surprised by the speed in which 
it's developed you know, since it sort of became part of the, the public consciousness. And then also at the same time, surprised by the reactions that it's generated. I mean, I've not been a uh, part of the development of any of this. So yes, I was surprised at the speed and continue to be surprised at the speed at which these technologies grow, which I think just makes it all the more important to understand how to use them appropriately and ethically. I'll have a different take on that. This is decades in the working, and it feels like things are progressing very, very fast all of a sudden because there's been a breakthrough, but that's built on decades of progress. And so I'm not convinced that this incredible speed is what we're going to continue to see. The natural language processing research that's part of the foundation for artificial intelligence began in the 1950s. Early experiments were used to translate Russian to English word for word. And from then, you can see the idea of AI come into culture through science fiction, which sometimes depicts a dystopian view of the future. As Dr. Sabi and Dr. Matthew and I talked, they brought up how warnings about the risks of AI technology from high-profile voices in the field have been distracting from the conversation. Recent research from Goldman Sachs estimating that 300 million full-time jobs could be lost or degraded due to generative AI has also been a major talking point. With all that in mind, I asked if they could understand why the public might be worried about issues like losing their jobs to a computer program or worse. So there, there's very big, scary language being used around this technology. But I, I think it distracts, again, from these near-term challenges that we do face today. And what worries me as someone who's been thinking about communication and AI for a long time, is if I was a young woman now entering the field, would I want to design a technology with existential threat in it? And it's also distracting from a policy perspective. It's very tempting from a policy side to say, okay, well, we need to figure out how to not have existential threats and we shouldn't pool all of our resources into that one question because we won't be addressing the very real near-term impacts. As you mentioned, the potential uh, challenges with jobs, the fact that all the students now are going to be using ChatGPT for their assignments. They already are for the ones that I'm marking in this season. And so we need to think about where we put the resources for the real challenges that we face today. Well, you raised some uh, very key points there, but I just wanted to pick up on that last point you made about, about its everyday usage now. Um, you know, let me turn to you, Matt. You know, Give us some examples of how you're using uh, AI with your students and how they're using it. And can you tell? Well, I think that the most important thing to say is that you can use AI ethically and you can use it in a way that supports rather than um, replaces student thinking. And that's a really important point that I need to get across. So teachers are using it in a whole host of ways. They're using it to support their classroom preparation. They're using it to create materials to use in classroom. They're using it to spark discussions about what is bias, how do we spot bias, how do we account for that bias within our own organisation. And it's a really helpful tool for those who perhaps struggle a little bit more with communicating their ideas to be able to get their ideas across now, one of the unhelpful ways is phrasing this all about students cheating. It's not a tool that allows students to cheat. It's a tool that allows students to look at what evidence is out there. In many ways, it's like existing search engine. They need to be transparent. So in the same way as if they copied a page out of a textbook, we'd expect them to say, we got this from this page. And would give them credit for researching it, but not for the ideas that were there. Sabine, how, how then have you been using AI in, in your work with swarm engineering and robotics? So I haven't been using it in my research yet, although we've started to ask uh, GPT to help us with some of our PhD projects. So for example, we were interested in designing a swarm of flying robots to do forest fire monitoring and mitigation on, on an area the size of California. So lots of drones looking for forest fires and trying to extinguish them before they take off. And, and we asked JetGBT if it had any ideas of swarm algorithms. This was me really playing around with it. It had an idea which was interesting, not, not as good as the one that we're developing, uh, but then we used it to design some code, build a little simulator. We ran that simulation. It had some bugs. We debugged it along with GPT. And, and it was just a really fun sounding wall for us to just think through ideas, play around with it, help us design some code very rapidly. And 
it wasn't anywhere close to what we need to design, but it was helpful. It was a really helpful tool. On a more day-to-day, -day, the way I use it in a mundane way is I had to produce a letter yesterday. I had bullet points for all the things I really wanted to highlight. And in five minutes, I had that letter written because GPT helped me do it. I edited it and I massaged it. So, so I see these tools as collaborations rather than replacements. But what do you think that says about you know, us as, as human beings you know, going forward? If you look historically back, you know, people sort of think, oh, when the calculator was first used in schools, this is going to make kids lazy. They're going to lose the ability to do mental arithmetic. Do you think there's a danger also that artificial intelligence is going to basically make us a bit more stupid? No, I really don't think that. I think the calculator um, comparison is both a really good one, but with some limitations we've seen that the calculator has helped us focus on different aspects of mathematics and probably the really important aspect of mathematics. I remember it as a student rather than as a teacher, but it really released me from that burden of having to be able to achieve the numeracy, which I was really, really poor at, and said, okay, with this calculator, now I can do the mathematical concept stuff. And that's what enabled me to go on to do it at A level degree and indeed a PhD in mathematics. So it really opened up doors for me. And I think ChatGPT will do the same for other students who perhaps are more challenged in communicating their wonderful ideas. To give an example, uh, recently I gave a talk to 126 and 7 year olds about robotics and I was showing them the inside of a robot and they knew what the motors were, what the sensors were, where the brain, the computer of the robot was. And then this was a robot vacuum cleaner. One of the kids raised their hands and said, how does it know where your kitchen is? And I said, well, it builds a map of, of your house. And then it said, well, where does the data go? And I thought, <laughs> goodness, these kids are switched on. And that's what we need, right? We need them to embrace the technology because it's going to be here and to be switched on. What was the answer to that question? Where does the data go? I said, good question. You should ask the company who <laughs> produced the robot. <laughs> Some of the voices I've heard of um, over the last few weeks uh, have said, look, you know, look at the, the, the people who've been criticizing, the people who've been developing AI have been coming out and warning against the dangers and saying, well, if these people were, were busy for so long creating all of this, surely they could have you know, perhaps foreseen uh, some of the potential problems and pitfalls. Why weren't women involved in some of the developments? Why weren't people of color brought in? Why aren't we hearing from those voices now? And the challenge is that we don't have a good handle on what data was used to train a certain prompt output with ChatGPT. So it, the same with image generation. There's not a good handle of what image allowed that beautiful image that you're seeing that was generated by DALI to emerge. And so it's very hard to reverse engineer whether the data was good because the data is gigantic and humongous and the parameters that link this data to the prompt that you're seeing is very opaque uh, and very difficult to decipher. And so we definitely do have a challenge with this. And we are seeing clear examples of simple prompts like you'll have a sentence with a man and a woman and you ask ChatGPT to guess which one is a lawyer and which one is a housemaker and you know it'll get it wrong sometimes definitely so the data is a huge issue but how do we make people sensitive to the fact that it is not getting that right yes and again that's a big part of i think the education we need to support and particularly with our young people to make sure they recognize that bias and they recognize that it will have biases even if they aren't biases they're already aware of. So that's a key point to get across to people. So, so quite a lot of road testing that, that, that still needs to be done there. That seems to be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, I wanted to ask you, because I know back in March, you were a witness at the UK parliamentary event uh, looking at education and AI. But when you look around Europe and the world, do you see any countries which you would say, yeah, they're, they're taking the right approach right I'm now? I'm not seeing any particular country I would want to hold up and say, in education terms, they are really on top of this. There's some countries who are doing some very sensible things around data protection, but for the most part, I think education systems are still coming to terms with the possibilities and opportunities. So I see individual teachers doing some really great things with this. But I think in general, 
the education system as opposed to individual teachers is running a bit to catch up and really understand. Okay. Sabine, I, didn't, I just wanted to follow up with on what Matt was saying there and perhaps expand the question to say, do you think this is something which requires government intervention or is this more, you know, something for the private sector? We need philosophers, we need people in education, we need government, we need policymakers to understand how we go from these big ideas to actually making them beneficial for society. And I think that's something we're all learning to do is how do you build the right consortiums to create the right regulations and policies so that it's done in, in a proper way. And yes, I think this needs to be done at a government level because it has to be more than business thinking about how, how this benefits society. Uh, well, let me ask to both of you, um, perhaps some might say that, that the most important question, you know, look into your crystal balls. How do you see the future over the next year, five years? I, I have a young child and I wrote a piece about what I think their life will look like in, in, when they're 18. And I think their life will look a lot like it looks like today, but with different tools, just like our life looks very similar to maybe our parents, but with entirely different tools. I think they're going to have the same trepidation about their friends, about what area they're going to be working in. And I think they're going to have these tools that make them live slightly different, but they're fundamentally going to be humans who care, who love, who do all the things that we do today, but in a slightly different way. I think fundamentally that is correct. I do think we're going to be able to see much more adaptive classrooms where students have the opportunity to engage in their own thinking a lot more and investigate things a lot more and move towards that understanding and making links rather than just recall of knowledge. So, you know, we've, we've spoken a lot about sort of what you see as the, the, the positive aspects of AI, but do you see anything at this moment negative, anything that could sort of potentially not be sort of under our control, so to speak? What are the risks? From my perspective, again, it's that fear factor that in education, people start throwing away really important aspects of education because they're frightened that it's being overtaken by artificial intelligence. There are ways of making sure that the students use this appropriately. For me, the risk is that we communicate it in such a way and deploy it in such a way that people feel like this is a technology done to them rather than a technology that they can use in their everyday life. I think that's the biggest risk. Well, uh, Dr. Sabine Howard and uh, Dr. Matt uh, Glanville, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you both. To learn more about Dr. Sabine Howard's work, you can visit howardlab.com, that's H-A-U-E-R-T, and aihub.org. And for more information about Dr. Matthew Glanville's work, please visit the IB Community blog. Euronews Tech Talk goes beyond discussions to explore the impact of new technologies on our lives. Do you have any questions? Please send them in and we'll find the answers. I'm your host, Takumbo Salako, and this series is written and produced by Marta Rodriguez-Martinez, Euronews Next tech reporter Camille Bello and podcast producer Naira Delvashian have also contributed to this episode. Our script editor is Dennis Funk. The theme music is by Leo Lebrun. Sound editing is by Jean-Christophe Marco and sound mixing is by Matthew Duchesne. Our editor-in-chief is Ali Hissan Aiden. You can listen to this series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox or wherever you normally get your podcasts. And for more information on the latest technology around, go to Euronews Next.